So first up, we've got our moderator, which is uh, Ryan Lessard from uh, one of our sponsors, Pollen VC. He's the uh, Vice President of Business Development. And then in no particular order, <laughs> I'll just uh, welcome everyone onto the stage and say uh, welcome to the uh, CEO of V2 Games, uh, Sam Chandola, the, the co-founder and COO of Fifth Harmony, Craig Derrick, and also the president and COO of Roadhouse Interactive, Tani Williams. So let's, let's give all of them a round of applause, please. I'll uh, leave it to you. Okay. Uh, is this, uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, cool. Um, awesome. So before we kick off a discussion around uh, leveraging licensed IP in your mobile games, um, I'd like to give uh, these three gentlemen an, an opportunity to introduce themselves. And, and uh, just to start off, well, I'll ask you, what, uh, what licensed IP, IP game are you, are you playing right now, or is your, your favorite over the last, uh, that's been launched over the last couple of years? Well, my name is Sam Chandola. I head up V2 Games. Uh, we're a local studio, actually, here in Houston and Seymour. Um, and we've launched um, a game in the past called Pac-Man Bounce uh, you know, in partnership with Bandai Namco. So you know, obviously, that was our first okay. big yeah, yeah, collaboration. And we have quite a few other IPs in the pipeline right now. Um, purely, I think, from a, from a great business perspective you know, and also from a gameplay perspective, um, I'm a huge fan of the Walking Dead series. Uh, I think uh, you know, Skybound's done a great job licensing it out to do some really good projects. Please? I knew it wasn't on. <laughs> it is on. Should I just be louder? Does this make a difference? No. How about this one? Oh. Uh -huh. <laughs> So I'll, I'll skip the introduction part, but you know, talking about The Walking Dead, I think Skybound's done a great job um, licensing it out to some really good development partners. Uh, and they've done a great job respecting the IP, and whether it's on, on, on PC or whether it's on mobile, I think it's doing really well both ways. Hi, I'm Craig Derrick from Fifth Journey, not Fifth Harmony. That's our boy band name. Um, I'm the co-founder and CCO of the studio, and I've been in the industry for 20 years, uh, focusing uh, my career entirely on branded IP over games, including Family Guy, The Quest for Stuff, Star Wars, Finding Nemo, did a Monkey Island game, did a couple other things as well. Um, you know, when I thought about the question and my answer to this question about um, what's my favorite IP, you know, type of game, I actually think about some of the bad ones. First of all, let me just say I thought of GoldenEye because people who play GoldenEye know that that's one of the best adapted IPs to a game. But but uh, but I started thinking more about the bad ones because that's where you learn from. And one in particular was one based on the movie The Crow long ago. Like it was. Just crap. Like, <laughs> and you should, like, uh, you know, when when all the old PlayStation games were starting to get like discounted, I would just go buy like the the really crappy Batman games, the Crow, like all of them, just to see how terrible they were. So, uh, I kind of want to focus on that. I think um, I think there's quite a bit more to learn there, um, as well as obviously the one he's bringing up too is great. I'll say that you know we did a good job on Family Guy as well, but. Um, I'll probably get into more details in a few. I'm Tarney Williams. I'm one of the founders of Roadhouse, along with being our COO and president. I've been in the games industry for 27 years, about 14 of that with Electronic Arts, was the general manager of Relic Entertainment for a while. Um, you know, Roadhouse has done a variety of games in IP, not IP. Uh, you know, in terms of, uh, not just, your question is not just what we've worked on, but just in general. Yeah. And I'm actually going to cheat a little bit. I actually think uh, my favorite game right now that I'm playing is Clash Royale. And that's actually their own IP from a different game that they've then reused in a different way. And I think, uh, you know, again, that's another interesting way that you can take advantage of intellectual property. Uh, and so there we go. Cool. And, and I'm Ryan Lassard. Uh, I run uh, US operations for a company called Pollen. And while we don't actually do anything that relates to licensed IP, uh, we work a lot with small and medium-sized game companies that are, uh, are, have free-to-play games in the mobile space. And increasingly, we're seeing smaller companies working with, with big IPs. Um, and uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of those companies are customers of ours. And so it's been something that's intrigued me. And I figured that there were probably some other studios uh, here, in, uh, here in the audience or at the conference that, that were interested in learning a little bit more about how uh, to find uh, an IP to work with and, and how to do some of those deals. Um, 
So I'm going to get out of the way and, and let the experts uh, talk a little bit more about it. My game, though, I've put a ton of time into Battlefront uh, over the last uh, seven or eight months or so. Um, so that's it's the, the top game for me right now. Um, so I'm a huge Star Wars fan. Um, so to, to kick off the conversation, uh, I want to start at the beginning for, for each of you in terms of the um, IPs that you worked with. So maybe you could share the, the first license IP deal that you did. Um, what was the project? What, what platform was it on? Um, and, and how did you discover or how did you, you, you know, decide on working with that particular IP? Do you want to start, Sam? Sure. Okay, this one's, this one's working now. So we're a very young studio. They have 20 years of experience in the industry. You know, we're two years old at this point of time. Uh, and that is a length of my industry experience as well. But we started off as a bootstrap studio, making lots of really, really small games. You know, very much you would consider us an indie studio at that point of time. And we had one of our own IPs called Boximals. Um, it was just, you know, animals in a box. Um, and we started making a suite of games on, on and, and put them out on Microsoft and BlackBerry platforms. We had Boximals Hockey, Boximals Strike, uh, you know, Boximals Dunk. Um, and we found that this one game of ours, Boxmills Hockey, started doing really well compared to everything else and said, OK, let's double down on this one and actually spend a little bit more time and energy focusing on this. Long story short, we ended up going and, and pitching that, worked on it, and started pitching it around to publishers. Um, the first publisher we went to uh, pub to pitch it was uh, Bandai Namco. Um, you know, and you know, they were great guys. They loved the game that they were doing. Uh, but they came back to us and said, you know what? We're only focusing on Bandai Namco IP at this point of time. So you know, it's a great project, but maybe not the best fit for us. So we were like, oh, that's fine. And we went back and you know, kind of worked very hard. And within a week, uh, turned it around and reskinned the whole game as a Pac-Man product. Went back to Bandai Namco and said, I know you didn't ask for this, but what do you think? Um, and you know, I have to say, we got really lucky and that we some really, really great champions uh, at the studio who really liked how quickly we turned something around and, and the effort we put into it. Uh, and out of nowhere, you know, a very young, small studio suddenly found themselves signing a deal with you know, one of the biggest IPs in the gaming world. So I would say it was the tenacity of us not giving up and saying, we'll get this come what may, ha having the hunger of that very small independent studio uh, that really helped us get that first IP that we wanted. You know, my first game was um, a mission pack for a game called Descent 2. And uh, that in itself is not a branded IP, but when I went into that, uh, I was, that was my first gig. And that game had already established certain rules around uh, the, the type of game mechanics and the, the universe in which that was created. And that, you know, when I think back on it now, really sort of prepared me to how I think of adapting IPs uh, that exist in other other mediums to games, because when you look at a at a product, you have to understand like what are the constraints, what are the rules, what can you play around with in that sort of box, and and what are um, what aspects can you not, and and so I've 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 kind of taken that into a lot of different types of titles that I've worked on over the years. Um, more recently, in the last year. Myself and my business partner uh, started this company called Fifth Journey, and our, our focus is on adapting Hollywood IP to mobile and VR. Um, we built it because uh, he and I both have, just quite frankly, a lot of passion and a lot of experience in doing uh, this. And that, with that comes a lot of exposure to how different IP holders run their business and how they manage their IP. Some do it through marketing, some people do it through the creators, some people you know, do it through consumer product. Uh, everybody has different sort of constraints and different sort of um, goals. And so you have to sort of learn how to do all of that and learn how to tell a great story and make a great game from it. Uh, so the challenge we've had, and we've been very lucky in the last year to sign five projects, um, all branded IP. The only two we've announced is one is a social adventure game with Kevin Hart, and another is a, a game based on The Expendables. And just briefly, I can tell you that with the Kevin Hart game in particular, it was just sitting in a meeting talking about an entirely different project when something about our experience came up. and. Uh, specifically Family Guy, The Quest for Stuff, which I worked on previously, which is a game that's kind of built around humor. And the idea of trying to use humor in a game kind of resonates with, with what we're trying to do with Kevin. 
And it was a matter of just reaching out to me and saying, can you do that? Can, can you think of an entry point into that game? And do you think, some, and you think it'll be something that he would like? And um, so I had to come up with a pitch. And then when I did, they flew me to Vegas to see his show and meet him backstage as he was kind of getting dressed. And I had to pitch him kind of an idea right then and there. And luckily enough, that kind of worked. So it was uh, pretty challenging, pretty exciting. But uh, in many ways, it's, it's, it's every lesson you learn along the way you take from every project you work on and, and into the next ones to solve the, the challenges of tomorrow. Yeah, I think I can echo that. I mean, the very first licensed IP I worked on was NBA Live 95. And you know, that was like talking about dating myself, you know. Uh, and that was with Electronic Arts, and I think you know, with that title, we you know, we changed the view. We made a whole bunch of changes, but certainly, you know, what uh, Craig was saying in regards to you know, how do you learn how to work with an IP holder, and you know, and really become their partner in an interactive space? Because you know, the the interesting thing for them is that they don't know anything about your space. They don't know what works or what doesn't work, and so there's a whole process of educating them around you know, how can we best bring the experience and the emotion of your brand of your intellectual property into our space to get the best experience for your consumers because you know granted fine we're making the game and we profit from it but so do they there's always you know value for them both in a in a overall branding sense uh, you know in increase of exposure of what their brand is and then you know actual direct payments to the IP holder and i think that that you know recognizing and working with them you know and uh, across the years many many different IPs that I've worked with, uh, you know, making sure that you really have those kind of very frank and upfront conversations with whoever you're working with about being a partner. And I mean, you know, if you think about the, like the latest thing we're working on is uh, Iron Maiden Legacy of the Beast with the band Iron Maiden. So that's uh, coming out global launch very shortly. But, you know, go back 18 months and in terms of how we approach them, you know, we had to think very much about, well, what, what's going to be authentic to them? And they're, you know, an iconic music act flew to England, you know, needed to approach them from a very different perspective. They'd been pitched 35 times, uh, you know, and probably got pitched a lot of very standard music games. And so we had to think about how do we come up with something that really speaks to them about their quality, about their intellectual property, about the history of the game. And so we actually, you know, created an RPG and, you know, pitched that to them about, you know, the, the sort of deep history of Eddie and everything else. And so I think it's that, you know, respect for the IP and then trying to figure out you know, really like you guys were saying, but what's the right way to make use of that in, in terms of an expression in an interactive media? Yeah, I just want to jump on that. If, if I can just jump on that really quick, I think that what Tarni's saying is, is absolutely true. Like what we're seeing today uh, with, with, uh, with taking IP into gaming is quite a bit different than 15, 20 years ago. I bring up the, you know, the crappy uh, Crow game because that's what IP games used to be. They were just shovelware. People would just throw an IP on something, brand slap it, put it out there, and hope that the movie did well enough to drive sales into the game. And and so they're just this this past is littered of of just bad uh, IP games. And today it's it's just quite a bit different. They're they're looking for uh, mobile gaming in particular to expand their audience, to expand their reach. And they too don't just want to take what's been done before and put their IP on it and, and brand slap it. They want to expand that world, and I'm sure that's what's happening with the Iron Maiden game. What what, what changed? I guess to build on it, like what what was the what was the driving force from the Crow game uh, or the you know the console games that were based on on movies to uh, to kind of broader uh, you know broader IP games on on mobile that we see that are t climbing the top 100 grossing charts. I think it, again, it's it's about authenticity. It's about the fandom around it. Um, you know, when working on the Family Guy game, there had been other Family Guy titles uh, in, in you know gaming, uh, but they weren't very good. Um, the first thing I think that we had identified was they were taking a 2D cartoon and a, and making them 3D. And I think this the format and that there's some sort of loss in translation aspect that happened there. Um, but one of the things we did is we sort of drilled down into what makes Family Guy the show and funny, and we figured it was the non sequiturs, the aspects of anything could happen, anything goes. And sort of to drill down on that and then figure out and build a game around that um, resonated with the show creators and the writers and such, and so and, uh, and obviously the audience. So I think the answer, to, from my point of view, is that the audiences for these games are the people who are following the brand in television, at Comic-Con, online, posting in the forums. And if you come in 
today with a game that doesn't speak to that audience, then they'll push you right out. We, we have a word at our studio for what you just said. It's called the tropes. So we want to understand what are the tropes of an IP. So by that, I mean not why people like the IP, but what about the IP do people like? So for Family Guy, you know, is it the nonsensical humor? You know, is, is that what's really standing out? When we were doing Pac-Man, the big question was, well, what do people like about Pac-Man? He always eats, right? Okay, that's something. The waka 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 sound effects, and that's something they always like. Uh, running from coasts, you know, and, and the game of hide and seek or cat and mouse that they're always playing. So we took a very established arcade game and converted it into a very different puzzle experience, um, and which was either a recipe for disaster or you know something that would really work. And we were very lucky; it was the other one, but. A huge factor was understanding what really ticked people about it and making sure that those elements were there. Um, if you open Pac-Man Bounce, you see a very new, you know, modern sound music coming in. But if you listen closely, you can hear the original 8-bit tone, you know, coming in in a retro sort of way as well. Um, so it's really the IP tropes and getting to know what people love about it that matters. Yeah, I think another thing historically that occurred was many, many, many IP games came out that were, in fact, not that good. And so certainly as consumers, I think people started being more and more wary. And as console cost to build and create went up dramatically, I think that more and more companies were ending up upside down on their IP-based games. And I think you know that actually had, you know as we hit some of the period of time when the industry had a bit of a challenge in the global financial crisis, I actually think we saw a big shift in the dollar amounts for upfront royalty structures uh, change with IP holders. And I think a lot of people went and said, hey, you know, it doesn't make sense for us to spend all of those dollars and not put them into the game because, you know, fine, you get your payoff, but then we don't get a payoff and the, the audience doesn't get a payoff. And I think as we've gone into this, you know, kind of mobile world, which is really free to play, uh, then, you know, and, and in many cases, a lot of brands actually are also trying to figure out how do you monetize a large audience? How do you get stored value out of that? And actually, mobile games are one of the interesting ways in which brands can monetize their audiences because they're like, hey, we can give you a really authentic, solid experience by creating a high quality you know, game. Uh, and games are, you know, I think at this point in time, the po most popular media. So you know, it actually makes a ton of sense for brands to extend into games. And they're a media that can monetize exceedingly well. I thought you guys were going to all say Kim Kardashian made the chance. <laughs> I mean, that's why they're the experts. Um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of that the kind of discovery phase, so do you find that uh, you see more opportunities from a brand that makes a decision to, uh, to be a part of, of mobile gaming? Or is it the other way where you're just a super fan of that brand and you're like, we've got to make this game because we love it and we're the right studio to do it. And you go out there and find a way to get in touch with somebody and, and pitch them on the concept? or go to their dressing room while they're getting changed or whatever. I think it can go either way, really. I mean, I don't think it, it matters whether it starts with them or with you. There has to be a spark. There has to be a connection. There has to be some, you know, in, in that conversation, whoever initiated it, both parties need to feel like, yeah, we can work together and we can figure this out. I mean, you know, and I think that actually is, again, as, as creators, that's a learning that, you know, again, why has it changed? I think it's because lots of creators got you know, burned, and probably lots of IP holders got burned by working with creators who didn't care for their IP and vice versa. So people were like, I just don't want to do that. Like, it's it's not very much fun to work with an IP holder who doesn't care about you or your game. Uh, and I think the corollary is exactly true if you're an IP holder and, you know, somebody's got it and you're like, oh, God, they're just putting out something terrible. That's really sad. If you're a studio that hasn't done it before, like TinyCo, um, and then you've, you've got uh, I, I don't know which way that, that uh, which direction that deal went, um, whether they came to you or vice versa. But um, but uh, how do they make the decision to, to do that when you haven't worked with a, a licensed IB, IP before? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, you, if, if, if you haven't worked in a licensed IP but have done something else of significance, whether it's build your studio or build a great back end or have the uh, analytics team that can manage, you know, what at the time we had, you know, multiple live games, they just weren't branded IP. So we had success metrics in place. We had a team in place. We had passion for particular things. Um, uh, switching over to a studio focused on, on IP, I think just was us reading the tea leaves a little bit. It was just like, 
discovery is a real problem and maybe there's something out there that we can look. And so we didn't just seek out Family Guy, we sought out a lot of different ones. Um, and so, but that one sort of resonated with us as a studio in no small part because it's a vast world. Um, there's tremendous amounts of characters and situations that you can use and leverage. Uh, it didn't hurt that the Simpsons game had done very well and Family Guy by nature always copies the Simpsons. So we, um, so you know, we had something that was already uh, out there, and you know, most of the games we had success with at Tiny Co were builders and, and invest in Express games. So there was just kind of a natural sort of connection there. It was not the only one. Um, obviously, the, they've got another game out now with uh, the Avengers Academy that's kind of been cut from the same cloth, but it advances further in the both story as well as technology and, and such. Uh, I just wanted to say, going backwards really quick for the, um, you know, we were talking about, you know, what um, the love or the authenticity of these IPs and out, out in the hallway we were discussing earlier about the um, the news today about Avatar and, and uh, the Kabam deal and so I just wanted to find out from the horse's mouth so I called a friend uh, who's uh, at Lightstorm and I said, so what is it about you know, what was it? What happened? Like, how long have you been, you know, working on this? And uh, he says, we've been working on this deal for, looking to find a deal for about two and a half years. And we've been trying to get a team, and we've been looking for a team that has that passion, that spark. So, so as it turns out, like, he, they probably got a, t a ton of terrible IP pitches, and they finally got somebody in there that said, I got it, I know it, and Lightstorm had the patience to wait for that. So I don't know that that lesson is there. Like you know, if if you believe in an IP and you see something that you think could really resonate, like go reach out to those people because maybe there's maybe they're waiting for you. One last thing I wanted to cover, and then we'll open it up for questions, is, is deal structure. So uh, today, for a mobile game, uh, if you're in a new studio, uh, let's say relatively small, maybe ten people. Um, uh, how are how are you approaching uh, licensed IP from a deal stand, like a financial standpoint? Um, is there a you know is there kind of a commitment up front that you're going to need to pay uh, some cash uh, out of pocket, or is it a purely rev share deal? What, what, what would they look like? So so the, what you described was us back when we got the Pac-Man IP. You know, small studio, less than ten people back then. Uh, first time uh, building something with IP. Um, I remember I had a, I had an instructor back when I was in uh, back when I was in college, and he used always say this one thing again and again, and he would drill it down and dust. He would say everything is negotiable. Period. Like that. Everything is negotiable. So I kind of approached our deal structure with the very same mentality of thinking everything is negotiable. And while I can't go into the specifics of you know the exact deal that was struck, um, I can say that you don't always necessarily have to have an upfront payment. Uh, up and running. Uh, it depends how good of a fit I think your pitch and concept is with what they are looking to do with their brand um, as well at this point of time. Um, so just go in there. It doesn't matter if you don't have the cash for an upfront payment. Maybe, maybe you can go and just secure the rights to the IP, right? And then you're like, okay, you need to come up with an upfront payment. At that point, you could probably go and raise some cash if you know that you have a big IP attached to it as well. So very flexible. Very flexible, and I don't think it matters if you're a first-time studio or if you've done it a lots of time in the past. If they are talking to you to a point where they're talking deal terms, that means they really like what you have pitched, and you could probably negotiate something. Yeah, I can echo that. I mean, I think every deal is different, and it it all depends. It's very much a how long is a piece of string. You know, I think the IP holder is interested in having something that is profitable, that provides accretive value to their brand and that they're going to be proud of. And so, you know, for them, really, those are kind of the three metrics. And so, you know, how do they get profitable? There's tons of ways to structure a deal. And I think, you know, the more times you've gone through that, there's, you know, upfronts and there's back ends and there's sliding scales up and sliding scales down. And there's, you know, there's a million different ways to do that. And there's, you know, exchanges you can make in terms of ads or other placements. And there's, you know, ways you can value ad impressions or in a, in a way or even impressions of their brand. I mean, there's just so many different ways that you can take a look at structuring a deal. And that's just one of the things. And I think in, you know, as a studio going and talking to somebody, one of the key things that you should do if you want to get a good relationship and as an IP holder that you should listen to is great. It's not just about profit because actually the other two parts are really important, which is, you know, what's the brand exposure and then what's the, you know, and how's that being a creative to your brand and is it something you can be proud of? Because even if you make a bunch of money, if it's the other two things, it's quite possible that fine, I made, let's call it $4 million just to pick a random number. 
but maybe that cost me $10 million in brand value. Well, that's not actually a profitable product because the next thing you do, maybe people are like, yeah, that last one sucked. Like, there's no way I'm touching them. And it may affect other aspects of what that brand does. It could affect whatever their core business is because they've now essentially sullied and tarnished themselves by having something that was lower quality than the kind of brand promise that they're already making. And I think, you know, approaching any IP holder with, you know, kind of that concept and saying, here's why we, as this developer, whether we're a first time developer or whether we're an experienced developer, believe with your brand, we can do these following things. And here's what's good to you. And here's what's good to us. And here's how we can work together to make that really successful. Anything different? Are you, Craig? No, you're I'm, I'm, I'm Thumbs up. Cool. Uh, okay, so I, I think we'll take some time for questions now if anyone has anything they were curious about. I can't, I can hardly see, yeah. 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 Go for it. Does anyone want to give some specific insight? I know you said there's many different ways it could be structured, but uh, a standard IP agreement with an established studio, what does that normally look like? What are the variables involved and what Maybe generally, what do those variables look like? You didn't talk last yeah, time. Go for it. <laughs> I know. Now I should have said something. <laughs> it's a tricky question. I mean, there's, there's, um, I mean, the variables can be what you would expect. Like, how much are we paying up front for just the opportunity to to license the the IP? Um, how much are we invested in for both development and marketing? Uh, the concept uh, the, the, all the way through. Um, there's retainment fees for talent associated with it. So Kevin gets a, it's something separate from the deal itself, even though he's, his name is a part of the product. Um, there's a lot of different um, ways to kind of cut the back end. Um, the, I, I can't honestly say that I've seen a template that 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 you know one size doesn't fit all, on, on these. Um, it it comes down to a lot of times what the IP holder values their IP on. Um, we've found some that you know what and what we look for is we look for evergreen IPs, ones that are. Uh, I've mentioned this today that you know we're working on an IP that if the if someone was dressed in the costume that is the main character in this IP, everyone in this room in this building would know it, but this particular IP, there is no current offering in mobile gaming for, for it. And so it seemed really kind of odd. And so we you know, structured a deal that suggests that we kind of know what we're doing with it, but, and, they didn't, and they, didn't have a, they didn't place a lot of value on it. So um, you can kind of go in that way too. You can kind of find things that you that you believe in that someone owns that maybe they know they're not making any money on, and 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 kind of get a deal that way too. Conversely, you're going to find people who overvalue their IP. There's some that that you'll find that just like I won't number, I won't name the number or put a number on it. But the Family Guy IP, for example, was much much more than I would have ever guessed just to have that. Um, thankfully, we sort of beat the odds on that. Just a question on that. So one of the IPs we're working on right now, as we were negotiating, uh, talking about overvaluing, one of the clauses that the IP holder put in was that we would pay the IP holder a dollar amount per every download that they would get. So, and it was negotiated out of the agreement eventually, right? But Cause so, because everything's, everything's negotiable, yeah. absolutely yes. But you know, that was a, a first time for us. We have never had a deal structure where they were, okay, we'll charge you know X cents for every download you have, and that really adds up. If you know, don't agree to that. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, so, anyway, so IP holders will have uh, um, different expectations on what they think their IP has to be in, and I think you have to find that nice middle ground. Um, you know, and again, like I said, if they're talking deal structure. They want it to happen as well, so I'm sure you can find one. I mean, I think I can't really add specifics, but I can say that there's always, and, and I think I don't think we've written any two deals that actually look the same. Um, but they do all have probably, like, I mean, we actually have a, a deal sheet template that we've created. Now, what's in those categories is different every time. But you, you know, what's the term? How long is it for? What's the territory? Is it global? What's the platform? You know, what are you licensing? Is there a genre involved? And what's that genre? Is it exclusive or non-exclusive? So, you know, what are you boxing out? And what does that exclusivity or non-exclusivity relate to? Is it your genre? Is it your territory? Is it your time? Is, you know, and, and 
often there are changes part way through that period. It can be exclusive in this area for this amount of time. And then, you know, what is an upfront payment? How does that get structured? Uh, and sometimes those can be structured as a minimum guarantee. It can be recoupable or not recoupable. It can be a license fee. So those are different ways to structure that part. There's, there can be a royalty payment. And as, as you mentioned, there can be a royalty payment to a variety of different holders there in that IP. There can be a cost per download. The way? A cost <laughs> Yeah, just don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> Someone could ask for a cost per download. <laughs> um, you know, on on products that have a price on them, certainly there can be that. Uh, you know, there you can have uh, returns or breakage and things. Again, that's more traditionally not on mobile side, but you know that. And then what is carved out of it? You know, how, how, what does it get calculated off of? Is it off of gross? Is it off of net? Is it off of, you know, net post the store? Is it before the store? How about taxes? How do we handle taxes? And so, there, you know, there's a lot of different components that go into a structure. And in many ways, you know, I'd encourage all of you to actually make your own deal template and think of all the categories. And even if you don't want to open all of those with the person you're talking to, perhaps they, you know, you don't want to negotiate on something and you'd rather, you know, we just said, well, it's going to be like this. Often that will occur, but you should at least make sure you're thinking about all of them to protect yourself. And in most cases, you should probably figure out how to talk about them with the partner because at the end of the day, if you haven't talked about it, it's a gaping hole. And usually that's where fights happen later on and you get into conflicts. And so you're a lot better off really to try and be quite comprehensive in saying here's how all of the various different parts work and then go through and negotiate all of those pieces. All right. I think, uh, I think our time is up. Thanks, guys. You can do one more. You can do one more, unless you're desperate to get out. No, no. no okay. It's good. So, uh, you know, I've been playing video games for a long time, and one of my favorite games was NBA Live '95. <laughs> Why wasn't Michael Jordan in the game? <laughs> so I can answer that. Yes. Uh, Sorry, this is like a self-serving question only. No, no, me, it's, and actually, it's, it's actually it's a really interesting situation that has to do with IP licensing. So. Uh, at that point in time, there are two licenses associated with the NBA. One of them is the NBA League license, and the other one is the NBA Players Association license. Michael Jordan had opted out of the NBA Players Association. And so at that point in time, the NBA Players Association license did not include Michael Jordan. It included everybody else, and nobody else had enough clout to be able to opt out of that. And uh, there you go. <laughs> He was later on in because we went and talked to him. So, uh, and again, that goes back to the, hey, call people up. You know, I mean, and that's how all sorts of these things happen is you just phone people and you say, hey, we think that this should be a thing. And people are often like, oh, yeah, that's cool. We do too. Hey, who are you? Oh, that's cool. Let's talk about that. And, uh, and that's why he was in later versions. So. So, can we have a big uh, round of applause for our awesome panel of for Sam, Ryan, Craig, and Taryn? Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much, guys.